Okay. Two whole slides. See, I told you I was short on content. Uh, so, because I've never given a long lecture with only two slides. We are moving out of the neurotransmitter genetic aspect that we're going to talk about hormones for the entirety of this unit. Okay? Uh, really, I could sum up the entire unit in one single word. It's got a few syllables. But read that word would be testosterone. That's it. So you can leave now. You know everything you need to know for the next exam. Just, just write in giant letters testosterone for every answer. And you will be correct. That's not exactly true, right? There is a lot more to the story than that. But that is going to be a major player in almost every conversation that we have. We're going to be talking about testosterone, okay? So, uh, up or down interactions with other hormones, genetic aspects, developmental aspects. We're going to be talking about all of this, right? So it's going to be exciting. We're going to spend, uh, I mean, what, this week, next week, the following week? Is there a week after that? I think it's like four weeks, right, that we're going to talk about this. So it's chapters 8 through 12 again. All right, so this particular chapter we're going to talk about context and ethology of vertebrate aggression. Wow, that's something new. Who remembers when we talked about this kind of aggression? Invertebrates. Lauren, I know you do. Because you specifically asked about crabs. It's a memorable topic. It was. Uh, so we're going to talk about vertebrates this time. For those of you that don't know, what is the difference between a vertebrate and an invertebrate? It's two letters, it's in. I get. Uh, one of those has a like spinal cord, right? Spinal column. The other one doesn't. Okay. So vertebrates, these are things we're going to talk about mammals, birds, reptiles, right? It's going to be exciting. Alright, so first we should start out with, we've never talked about this. What is aggression? And Bree, I actually I actually kind of thought we'd already asked this question. Right? And we did. Uh, but we're going to ask it again. And we're going to ask it this time in a slightly different context, uh, thinking about other things. So as we should know, why do we have to keep asking what is aggression? And we have to keep asking what is aggression because it's really difficult to determine. Right? It's, it's, Katie, it's, a, it's a really complicated question. Right? And it's, it's really, like, what is aggression? So it's difficult to determine. Now, one of the things that makes this difficult is comparisons across species, right? This wasn't actually that difficult with crustaceans because when we talked about crustaceans, they were all sort of doing the same thing. Although there were still differences there, right? So some of that, Amanda was, uh, you know, the mural spread, some of it was shell wrapping, some of it was squirting urine out of eyes, right? All of these things. But there were some common elements across crustacean species and we were okay. Now, most of that does not apply to uh, mice, for example, right? I mean, we've talked a little bit about aggression in mice, and that becomes, that becomes difficult, right? So if, if we wanted, Tiffany, if we wanted to compare aggression between a lobster and a mouse, and we said, it's only aggression if urine comes out of your eye. Well, that mouse is never going to be aggressive. Because no matter how hard you squeeze a mouse, urine will never come out of its eye. I promise you. You can look that paper up on PubMed. It's there. It's probably something with like manual grip strength and mouse urine exit or something. I, I don't know, right? But you can, you can look that up. I'm trying to think of a fancy scientific title for squeezing a mouse until it feeds. Surprisingly, you don't have to squeeze that hard. Uh, I had a turtle pee on me once. I tried to save its life. Hey, <laughs> Meredith, this was in Winston-Salem. It was, you know where that uh, swamp is by that Harris Theater you told me is no longer there? Yeah. So there was a turtle on the sidewalk headed toward the road. So first thing, I do something really weird. 
and I pull off into this daycare parking lot, right? And so, like, here's this weird guy getting out of his car at a daycare parking lot. I don't have kids, all right? And so I get out, and I have to run back up the sidewalk to catch this turtle because it's almost out in the middle of the road. So I grab the turtle. It's a big turtle. It's like this big. It's like a, uh, it's a slider, right? Which they normally don't get this big, right? So this is like a super old big turtle. Uh, you know, most sliders are, are smaller, you know, those species. So this is like a big turtle. So I grab this turtle, and I pick it up. <laughs> Like a horse, stream <laughs> of urine comes out of this thing, right? Uh, and I'm like, ah. <laughs> and so I have to just like put it down. But thankfully, I, I apparently scared it. Uh, and I scared it enough so it went like back into the water. It ran the other way. So I was happy. But the cool thing was it had like this big scar and like was missing half of its beak and one of its eyes. So it had like this, like it was like this, like an old scar too. It was like missing like this big chunk. So I've been in a fight with something before. I don't know. Probably like a beaver or something. That's what I imagined. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so there you go. Very difficult to determine uh, what is aggression and what constitutes aggression. However, this is if we're observing this from the outside, right? If we're looking at their behavior or uh, ethology is the study of behavior. And so if we're looking ethologically at this, if we're looking at the behavior of this animal, it's going to be really hard to determine, like, is that aggressive? Is it being more or less aggressive? Is it more aggressive when a lobster shoots urine out of it, its eyes or when a mouse bites another mouse? Which is the more aggressive act? Oh, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of hard to compare that, right? So we can't really go across the trip. However, we can we can start to look at hormonal activity, okay? And we can measure changes in hormonal activity during different, different actions, right? And we can use that, Brandon, as a scale of what's aggressive or what's not aggressive. We can compare different behaviors that are going to be because all of these behaviors are going to vary depending on the uh, the species and its environment, right? How many of you know that lobsters and mice live in two different habitats? Okay, lobsters primarily live in an aquatic habitat at your grocery store. Um, they live in an aquatic habitat. Mice, on the other hand, do not like aquatic habitats. I will tell you, if you've ever tried to keep your mouse and your goldfish in the same container, Bria doesn't work. You will find out quickly, right? The mouse is not going to be, and the goldfish probably is not going to be happy either. They don't really like to share their space. So mice live in, uh, t typically a mouse is going to live in sort of a, a meadow or a forest kind of area. In the state of the Two different environments. So their behavior has to be different. They have different responses, they have different predators, they have different um, weapons that they're going to use to attack each other, right? Okay. So they're going to have a different set of behaviors. Does that make sense to everybody? So it's really difficult to compare this across species. We need to find what is that common thing. For a lot of species, we're going to be able to use hormonal activity, right? As a, as a judge of whether or not that's an aggressive behavior or not. I thought it was interesting the way these authors sort of define different types of aggression. You know, Brad, you were really concerned about just like one or two definitions, right? Yeah. And so, so they added a few things. And I think actually Thank these, God. huh? Thank God. I know, right? Finally. I actually thought the way that they, they defined some of these was interesting. And I like I liked this approach better. They have what they call spatial aggression. Uh, that's territory defense or territory related, right? So that makes some sense. Now, some of these types of aggression can clearly overlap. Okay. In particular, they have another one that's related to uh, ingestive resources, right? So thinking about like like food and water. And obviously, I, I think Katie, we see a sort of a an overlap there already, right, with 
territory can have access to these in jet, right? So some of these things overlap, some of them don't, but some of them do. What was spatial? Uh, it's related to territory, like occupying and, and, and maintaining the territory. <clears throat> So we have spatial, we have ingestive. They also identify dominance, right? So this is kind of in those social hierarchies, right? There's aggression related to being the top lobster, the top mouse. I'd like to make an old cartoon joke and say top cat. I don't know how many people would get that one. No one? You're missing out. There was an old cartoon called Top Cat. He was this alley cat who wore a vest and a hat really makes sense. I've never understood why it's just weird that they don't wear pants but they'll wear a shirt. Like like if I mean you don't see humans do this, right? You don't see like humans just wear shirts and no pants. Like that doesn't work. You're more likely to see a human wear pants and no shirt. And so if you're gonna anthropomorphize an animal, I think they should follow the same rules. I think they should wear pants and not a shirt. I don't know about you, but I'm more likely to walk well, walk around without pants than walk without walk around without a shirt. At least at home. I mean, not in public, but. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I mean, I guess it's different for different people. I, 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 there's a whole line of follow-up questions that I can't ask. We had this discussion. Usually they're my boyfriend's shirts, so they're like big on <clears throat> Okay, so that's technically pants. I mean, <laughs> if it comes down far enough, it's pants. <laughs> Lauren, you seem like you have a serious question. I do, actually. <laughs> well, because you were talking about dominance and how yeah. everybody has to be like the top cat or the top animal. But does it vary between the gender of the species? Yeah, so that's actually a really interesting question, Lauren. Okay. Um, many species are sort of patriarchal and some are matriarchal, right? And there will actually be, and there are some species that are sort of a combined what you will typically see in most species, and now this isn't necessarily 100% always true, but in most species, you're going to see separate dominance hierarchies for males and for females. They're not going to intermingle. Okay, so you're not going to have a dominance hierarchy uh, that can be male, male, female, male, male, female, 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 male, female, right? So it's not going to alternate. It's going to be one for males and one for females. Typically, that's what you see. Dina. Um. Is this agreeing with the last definition that we like went over, where it was just between the same species? Uh, so far, yes. There's going to be in a in a in a in a, in a spot or two over, we're going to have something that's a little different. But that they they also ignore that part. <laughs> but it's still there. But yeah, so far this is all. Um, at least so far, this is all what we would call inter uh, inter. In intraspecies, right? So it's within the same conspecifics, right? So it's going to be lobsters fighting lobsters. It's going to be mice fighting mice. And you don't typically, also, you didn't ask this question. But you typically do not see a dominance hierarchy that would alternate between species. Right. Although I'm starting to think about this because um, I'm, I'm re I really am. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to create like some artificial situation brief where I'm putting a bunch of horses with some donkeys and mules, and I'm starting to wonder if, like, they, did you see what I'm saying? Like, if they'll create a dominant, like, can I artificially create a dominance hierarchy that's interspecies? I think that'll be like cats and dogs. Those yeah, it, I think it would be a similar situation, right? I think it's more like predator prey kind of this thing. Like, you know, you, just, you assist the situation, like, this guy's bigger than me, but I think that happens with any species. You know, like in the jungle, there's like the king of the jungle and yeah. there's like other animals. Like, yeah, the king of the jungle who lives in the savannah. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I did, sorry, Dina, I had to. You just set me up for that. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know. So how many of you have cats or dogs and like a turtle? I think a turtle's got to be in this. Uh, <laughs> What would be interesting is to see if, do you have multiple cats and dogs, and do they live together? Yes. What, like in the same, like not just like inside out, but like together. Uh, what I'd like for you to do over the next couple weeks is observe their sort of dominance hierarchy mm -hmm. and see if it alternates between species. 
like, like, is there a dog that outranks a cat, but then a cat that also outranks a dog? You see what I'm saying? Because if it's all like all of the cats and then the dogs are on top, or all of the dogs and then the cats are on top, then that's not really, that's yeah. like two separate dominant That's what we have this cat that kicks my dog's ass like all the time, and he doesn't, he doesn't mess with her, but then we have this younger dog that messes with her all the time, but then my dog like kicks that dog's ass, but then that dog like kicks the cat's ass that kicks the bigger dog, like it's wild. I'm going to make a flow chart. <laughs> Another serious question? No, I promise. Okay. This is actually going off her cats thing. <laughs> I have four male cats. One's a kitten. One doesn't grow hair on his butt. And <laughs> the other two are just like fat and sassy. I'm not sure why that is important. But <laughs> well, because he's like a weaker version of a male cat. So, but listen, so I have my first cat I had, Max. He, they have like sectioned off zones. So he's upstairs and my other big cat is downstairs and they don't intersect ever. Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of interesting. But they all like the other two just kind of like are allowed to intersect because they're not even worth fighting. It's kind of like my house. There's three cats at my house and uh, there's three like levels at my house and there's a cat on each level. And my cat, who's typically on the second one, has been like going downstairs a lot, making that cat mad. But it's fun. So I have two male cats, and they're like BFFs, mm -hmm. play together all the time. They share the house equally, and so that's really interesting. It's cool. It's fine when you got two. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want you. Two. So why don't you take one? She, I mean, she's got four cats. Obviously. You can have one. That's one's more fine. than she needs. <laughs> so if you would take one, and let's see what happens. Okay. We'll add the one. Also, there's this cat that lives near my apartment complex. If you could catch it, you can have it. <laughs> it's like this big, and it's black. Does it have like a little tuxedo? No, it's like, like solid black. I'll take it. Cute. Yeah. Catch it and give it to me. It's yours. I'm not going to try to catch it. <laughs> All right. I think too many of you have cats. <laughs> So spatial, ingestive, dominance. Uh, there's also uh, sexual. This is related to obtaining mates or to uh, you know a sort of protection of mates, right? So we talked a lot about the uh, remember the red deer barking at each other three thousand times, um, and then they fight each other. That's for access to mating opportunities. Um, remember the lobsters who would defend the molting female lobster, right? So that's also going to fall under this sort of sexual uh, aggression definition. There's also, this is the one now we're getting into one that is, um, Dina going to be ignored, and it's going to involve other species. That's anti-predator. Okay, so that's going to be, um, if you are a rabbit and you try to fight off a wolf or something, those awesome defense ears. <coughs> Actually, they would use their ears as defense, right, to run away. That wasn't a joke. Uh, and then finally, there's something they call irritable aggression. And I felt like they sort of left it there, uh, <laughs> which was sort of irritating. Uh, <laughs> and then I threw my book. So I, I, I don't know if that was what they meant or not by irritable aggression, but I, I think it is. And I think, Brad, this goes to your sort of frustrate, right? And so we're going to spend some time later talking about the effects of frustration and stress on aggression. One of the important things that we always need to take into consideration is this concept of phenotypic flexibility. This is actually really awesome. We probably have the most phenotypic flexibility of any species. And if you want evidence of that, think about all of the environments in which humans live. And then think about all of the environments in which lobsters live. 
and we live in far more environments, right, than, than they do, so we're able to interact with our environments in different ways. Phenotypic flexibility is simply the ability to adjust your behavior based on context, right? You're not going to always have that same set reflexive response to a stimulus. Okay? You have the ability to adjust and to change your behavior, right? So we already talked about with invertebrates, for example, we talked about context being important in terms of uh, aggression and courtship. Okay. So if we had uh, a situation where it was a male and a female lobster, the male lobster would not probably display aggressive behavior, right? But if that was a male and a male lobster, then they would, even if the female lobster was no larger and threatening or, or whatever their different sort of context. Does that make sense? Limited phenotypic flexibility can be problematic, but it's really only problematic in certain situations. And what we really want to think about is whether or not your environment is predictable or unpredictable. And every environment has some predictability and some unpredictability, right? So it's not the, the exact presence or absence of either of these. Emily, it's, it's, it's the proportion, right? And so what are some predictable elements in your environment? How many of you realize that tomorrow the sun will be up? And how many of you realize the following day the sun will be up? And then guess what, Meredith? It, it happens like every day. And it's happened every day for at least a few years, right? So it's been going on a while. That's a very predictable element. Other things that are predictable, uh, seasons, right? Seasonal variation is, is roughly predictable, right? You know, every few months you get a change, right? You have summer, you have winter, those are predictable things. Things that are not predictable. Without, okay, and we have to think about if we were a, uh, if we were an animal that did not get cable, okay, uh, things that could not, that are not predictable. Storms are not really predictable, right? So a thunderstorm is not really predictable in the wild, right, to an animal. I mean, an animal is not, it's not going to get a thunderstorm every day. It's going to be a random event over the course of a year. Right? Now there are, of course, uh, seasonal variations in that, but on a day-to-day -day readout, you're not going to know, is it going to rain today or not? Uh, you wouldn't know that ahead of time, right? So that would be unpredictable. There are other things that are unpredictable. Invasions of other species. Invasions of other species, absolutely, that's unpredictable. Diseases, you know, that, that could come through. Now these can change your um, access to food, to any of these other sort of resources, and it can affect your levels of aggression. Okay. If you have high phenotypic flexibility, you will do really well in an unpredictable environment. you have low phenotypic flexibility, you better hope your environment is predictable, Jessica. Because if it's not, guess what? It's not going to work. Okay. What's the saying? If you're a hammer, everything's a nail? That's a saying, right? Has anybody heard that one? Well, I just said it. If you're a hammer, everything is a nail. Right. So what can a hammer do? It can hit a nail. That's really it, right? works really well if you're only exposed to nails. What if all of a sudden you're exposed to cheese? Using a hammer on cheese doesn't really work, does it? How many of you have parties and you have cheese at your parties? Anybody ever been to a party with cheese? Yeah, <laughs> okay, okay. So Brooke, you're, you're gonna use a hammer to slice your cheese. How's that gonna work? Not well. No, <laughs> not well, right? 
<laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think most people like pulverized cheese. I, I guess you could like. Unless you get to like a fondue at that point, I guess. <laughs> what kind of cheese? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure it's important. <laughs> I, I mean, maybe, maybe like you're thinking about like crumbled blue cheese or something. Maybe a hammer yeah. works there. I was actually <laughs> thinking of like American sliced cheese because that's flimsy. You could cut that in half with like anything. You really think you? I want you to go home <laughs> and someone to take their phone and watch you and video you hammering <laughs> cheese, and then and then you're gonna start a whole. YouTube craze, a whole channel is just going to be called Hammering Cheese. And you're going to do different kinds. You can get some brie. You can get some provolone. You can get some Parmesan. Right? Go with some cheddar. Sharp versus mild. Which hammers better? <laughs> Check and see if that's a channel first. Probably. Hammering Cheese. If not, I think we have just hit on something. Hammering Cheese? Wait for it to Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Hammering cheese. What do you think about that? I mean, people do all kinds of great stuff. They love destroying things. Yeah, we're pretty good at that. Yeah. Uh, I will hit a lot of things with a hammer, but not my cheese. It's just like kids hitting cheese pops with hammers. That's not really the same. No. So the channel's open. There's a market for this. Yeah. I know there are going to be some people who really enjoy watching people hammer cheese. So, the point of this is if your phenotypic flexibility is low and all you can do is hammer, that is not going to work in all situations. It's going to work in one situation. A situation where you're like putting a nail into a piece of wood. A hammer works. But if all you have is a hammer, it's not going to work in other situations. How many of you have ever tried to send a text message using a hammer? That doesn't work, does it? No. Nobody's going to do that. You, you should try it, right? I can see someone like, you could, right? It, 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 I mean, because it's, you know, maybe it can, it's, it's capacitive, right? So you can use it as like a, like your touch, right? But I think it's going to be difficult because the head of the hammer is bigger than your finger. Right? You know where I'm going with this, right? All right. So. Most species are in some sort of unpredictable environment. Those species that are in highly unpredictable environments need to have high phenotypic flexibility so that they can respond appropriately to different types of aggression. Okay? If your phenotypic flexibility is low and your response to a threat is always to attack, right, let's really try to bring this back to an aggressive behavior. If your response spontane is always to attack, that will work sometimes. It'll work when you're bigger than the other member of your species. It will not work if the other member is bigger. So you want that phenotypic flexibility so that you can recognize whether or not you can win that particular encounter. Now there's a trade-off here. It's a real trade-off, and, and this is maybe not terribly important, Katie, to, the, to this, but I want you to think about it. Based on what I've told you, you should say, if I'm given the choice, I should, I should always take high phenotypic flexibility, right? I, I mean, that, that, that makes sense. Why would you choose something else? Why would you choose low phenotypic flexibility? Doesn't make any sense, right? The problem with that is, it's all about resources, right? And so you have a limited number of resources that uh, developmentally that you can devote to one system or another. And if you devote all of your resources to phenotypic flexibility, then other things might be sacrificed, right? And so you might not have the ability to like have a heart or eyes, and then you don't have anything you can use to actually change your behavior, but you have that flexibility, right? So there's a trade-off. Because phenotypic flexibility takes a lot of brain space. Think about how big your brain is compared to that of a spider. Does it have phenotypic huh? flexibility? They do, but not much. Not much compared to you, right? Uh, and they don't have much brain space. So they didn't devote a lot of brains to that. But they live in an environment, that typically, that is relatively predictable in, in what they do. Uh, so they don't have to have it. So they're going to devote their resources to other things, like developing really creepy legs. 
So that makes sense, right? But eons ago, there was some random mammal who said, you know what I like? That other kind of grass. So I'm going to eat it, see what happens. It didn't die. And it had offspring. They didn't die either. Next thing you know, big brains. That's how it works. Uh, there was this other theory in there I, I kind of wanted to briefly touch on. It's finite state machine theory. I know that sounds kind of really fancy. But really what I want to take away from this are these life history stages. And this is going to be really important because um, hormones change. But behaviors sometimes can be the same, right? So, how many of you have ever seen a four-year-old punch another four-year-old? Oh, right. Emily, your hand went up fast. I worked at a daycare for two years. There was a lot of punching of four-year-olds and other four-year-olds. I'm glad you clarified by other four-year-olds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because... I, I had to. I started it, and then I was like, oh, wait. That makes a completely different story. Yeah, that was a lot of us punching four-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> we were closed down pretty soon. We opened... So, uh, four-year-olds who are punching each other, that's an aggressive behavior, it happens. Uh, that is probably not as much under the influence of testosterone, for example, as two 15-year-old males punching each other. Have you ever seen two 15-year-old males punch each other? They don't both have to be 15, one could be 14. Does that help you? I mean, it kind of broadens the experience, right? Uh, when two teenage males fight, uh, that probably does seem to be under the effect of testosterone, right? More so than, than little kids, because little kids don't have as much testosterone, male or female, right, as, as adults uh, or adolescents would. And that's because of this thing we'll talk about later called puberty. I don't know if any of you have experienced that. I'm going to assume everyone has. I think I can make that safe assumption. Uh, for some of you, it's pretty obvious you have. Um, actually, I think probably for everyone it should be, right? I mean, you, you kind of know. It's not like a thing to hide. Um, at that point, hormone levels change drastically, right? So, they're, But still, the behavior is the same, right? You still, you still may be trying to take something from someone else. You still may be punching them. Uh, but that control is going to be, the control of that behavior is going to be different hormones and maybe even different brain circuits are involved, right? And so the important thing to take away from this uh, finite state machine theory is that, yeah, life history stages, they change. Just because the behavior is the same at these different stages does not mean that the hormones are the same that are driving that behavior, nor does it mean that the neural circuits are going to be the same that drive that behavior. These things change, right? And that's an important thing to keep in mind mostly as we go forward. We're not going to talk too much more about that today, but I definitely wanted to make sure that you had that for your, um, for now. All right. Questions about this slide? Yeah. Um, the phenotypic flexibility, you said spiders kind of have it, but my question is to cockroaches. Yeah, most species are going to have some degree of it. It's, it's, it's again, it's not typically a yes, it's present or no, it's not okay. present. It's how much of it do you have, okay. right? How much flexibility do you have in your behavior? Um, how much can you read the context? Right? Now, obviously, invertebrates are going to have less of it than vertebrates. Vertebrates have more complicated nervous systems. The more complicated your nervous system, the greater your degree of phenotypic flexibility. So you can pretty much create a continuum from like earthworms up to humans with somewhere in between other species. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good question. If you have more questions about this, what I would recommend you do, no, I'm going I'm to give you a real recommendation. I would recommend, there's a great class they offer on this campus called Animal Behavior. I would recommend you sign up for it. They're offering it, I, I think, they're offering it in the summer. 
online if you want to take it. Brad, why are you laughing at that? We had this conversation. I know, but it's important. Right. Yes, and I do teach that. That's, so you'd have to like sit there listening to me again. And if you don't want to take it in the summer, that's your only option. Right. Right, President Gilbert, about getting more people in the psych department. Did I say something about that once? Yeah. Yeah. How many of you have ever sent an email to President Gilbert? Anybody ever sent an email to Jerry? He prefers Jerry, by the way. Went, right? I mean, I've met him several times. You've met him, Dina. He prefers Jerry. Right? This is the moment where you should tell everyone that you've met Jennifer Garner. Do you, do you want to take a moment and do that? Not really. Uh, not really? Why? I mean, I just didn't think it was relevant. It's not, but <laughs> you, should, you should always throw that in. Yeah, like the last time I talked to Jerry, it was with Jennifer Garner, and we were See, you could just work that in. I mean, I talked to him like last week. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I didn't talk to him last week. Actually, the last time I talked to him, it was, actually, the last time I talked to him, it was about something related to this class, uh, but, but really shouldn't have been. Um, we were at a dinner or at a lunch about brain parasites. <laughs> no, really, <laughs> was, that the, was that the lunch about brain parasites? It was really great. We actually had, this guest speaker on campus last semester, and she was like, it was this book called This Is Your Brain on Parasites. It was actually a really brilliant book. Um, and she was, she was, did you read the book? I read a chapter from it. You read a chapter from it. I read the whole book, and then she signed it for me. But my book looked awful. She thought I read it multiple times. I just kept sticking it in my bag. And every time I stuck it in my bag, the cover bent. And so it looked like I read it more than once. I did read it once, though. Anyway, we had this conversation about, um, like chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. And so this actually relates to your question about the male-female hierarchies. So in a lot of primate species, the, they're uh, patriarchal, some are matrimonial, whatever, right? Um, kind of depends on the species. But for example, in, in bonobos, it's actually really common for this to happen in bonobos, which are a super awesome species we'll probably talk about later. They're kind of like chimps, but kind of like chimps, like we're kind of like chimps, right? So we're all sort of in that same uh, we'll have another little discussion in just a moment. Dana, hang on. So anyway, they were talking about something, and then you know, it, while I was trying to pick my way through this chicken that they were serving, um, if it's not the whole time I was eating it, I was thinking about brain parasites. Uh, so, so there was a lot of food that that wasn't eaten at that lunch. And, you know, when, when you're talking about parasitic infections, people are not going. Cowing down on the chicken, right? Uh, he's like, I'll just take a glass of water. So, in bonobos, uh, there are like male and female hierarchies. When two males will fight each other, and they do this from time to time, not not that often in bonobos, it's more often in other species, they, but they will fight each other. Uh, quite often, the um, top female will grab each of them by the hand and then like pull them together and make them sort of be friends, uh, which is really kind of fascinating, right? It reminds me of, of Emily and these two four-year-olds who are fighting, and he's like, grab them both, usually by the ears. Uh, this is how you always grab four-year-olds, it's always by the ears. Uh, and you just like, to need to be friends, right? Like how many times have you seen like one of your parents do that? No, never Jessica. No, it was always, I hope one kills the other, so I only kill one after. <laughs> I'm liking your parents more than I thought I would. Um, I don't know, right? That's pretty cool. There you go. Uh, so anyway, it, see how that story was related, Dina? I mean, no, you didn't say what Jerry said. Uh, I believe he just said, wow, that's fascinating. Oh, okay. I don't know. I'm not really sure what he said. I think people were surprised I was talking. Uh, I was very fortunate to get a seat at the head table. I was with the author, uh, Jerry, the provost, and four deans. And then there was me, who I'm like way down on the, the scale from those folks. Uh, surprisingly, I had the most interesting things to say. Uh, <laughs> that's actually a fairly true story. Uh, and the, the, the author was actually far more interested in talking to me than I was the other people. Uh, largely because none of the other people 
like understood brains quite the same way. So we actually had some really nice conversations. And everyone else just kind of sat there in awe of my brilliance. That's how I remember it anyway. They may remember something else. So there you go. But the bonobo story is a good story, right? So that shows you that there are these sometimes separate hierarchies. But on the other hand, there are times where uh, a member of one hierarchy can step into the other and kind of like straighten things out. Does that work? Who loves bonobos? Anybody? Anybody know anything about bonobos? I should tell you about them someday. They're really fascinating. Originally, they were called pygmy chimpanzees. Uh, and that's largely because people were idiots. Uh, they're in fact a completely different species from chimpanzees, despite the fact that, like, if you were to see them, you might think, well, they're the same. Uh, the closest bonobos you'll be able to see, I think, are in um, Columbus. I think the Columbus Zoo has some bonobos. Is that true? Yeah. Uh, they have some bonobos there. And they live in a colony and they do their thing. What I would recommend you do is for the summer move to Columbus and then just get a membership to the zoo and sit there and, and watch the bonobos all summer. I feel like a really fascinating thing to do. No, that's true. They're, they're fascinating. Um, they're largely, they're far less aggressive, and so this is important, they're far less aggressive than uh, chimpanzees are. They are still aggressive and they have aggressive behaviors, same as anybody else. They're very um, free-loving, I think is the phrase I would like to use. Um, very free-loving. Uh, as a species, they, they constantly try to have sex with other bonobos, but the problem is there's usually a bonobo in between, like while you're on your way to the other bonobos, you always have to stop, right, and say hello, and, and, and that usually turns into something. Uh, and so I don't know if they ever make it to their intended target, because that, you know, it's constant moving around. Um, yeah, did you look up bonobos? Yeah. They're fascinating. I just didn't know, like I didn't know they were called like the pygmy chimpanzee, yeah, that's a stupid name for them. Yeah, I know. But they are quite different in height. I looked it up. Oh, but they are. They're, they're small. Yeah. They, they look completely different. If you look at their facial structure, they're completely yeah. different species. Right. Uh, and they live on a different side of a river. Yeah. There's a river that splits the chimpanzees from the bonobos. Do they get along at all? Or they don't interact. Oh, okay. If they were to interact, I would assume the chimpanzees would kill them. Yeah. That's probably. my assumption. Because the chimpanzees being more aggressive. Who remembers what we learned about the aggressive, uh, invasive, Mr. Dorr, this is for you, uh, crayfish. Remember, and they killed off the other uh, native crayfish, the invasive crayfish did. So the more aggressive species will take over. And given that bonobos and chimpanzees largely occupy the same ecological niche, I think that the chimpanzees would win that. They're bigger, they're stronger, they're more aggressive. So I believe they would win. Although bonobos might be a little smarter. Yeah. Um, or a little less focused on just like biting and punching, and so they might be able to devise a plan to win. Does that mean they're higher phenotypic flexibility? Possibly. They probably have a slightly higher phenotypic flexibility. Not, not by much. Maybe enough. You don't know what that, what, what do you need? So that's a great trade-off. Um, you know, that's actually a pretty interesting point. How much higher does your phenotypic flexibility need to be to be successful in your environment versus just being bigger and stronger, right? And so that's actually a pretty interesting uh, debate. So there you go. Anybody else, any questions about bonobos? I'm more than happy to, to answer them. I know more about bonobos than all of you combined. Yeah. They have some in Atlanta as well, actually at, at um, Emory University. He's primate center. Just were curious. Planning a road trip, Brie? Yeah. <laughs> Columbus is closer. Not nearly as exciting, but I don't know. Columbus is a legitimate city, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a legit city. I, I mean, it's you know, Atlanta's bigger, of course, but and I'm assuming that this is not downtown Atlanta. I, I think it's on the outskirts of uh, <laughs> of the city. Other works there. At Emory? Yeah. That's cool. They're okay. not allowed to talk about their job. <laughs> They're not allowed to talk about their job. That's interesting. Yeah, they do some big stuff there at Emory, actually. Uh, I knew a guy who went to school there and he studied uh, like 
mathematical models of invasive pests, uh, pests like and how they affect crops. It's kind of interesting. All right. Questions before we move on. Now we're in the second half of the lecture. Hormonal control. How many of you remember serotonin? We talked a lot about serotonin. Serotonin is fast, right? Kaylin, that neurotransmitter is going to be released right now. It's going to have some effect on your nerve cells, your brain cells, your neurons. They're going to do things, right? Neurotransmitter is released. It's going to open and close. Ion channels, that neurotransmitter is going to disappear. It's going to happen in milliseconds. It's going to last a millisecond. That's it. Hormones have longer lasting effects. This is why we use hormones. This is why we have an endocrine system and a nervous system. <coughs> Your nervous system is very rapid. It's very um, discreet and specific. right? But it doesn't have long lasting effects. Those neurotransmitters they're in the synapse, they're out of the synapse. That's it. It's very fast. Hormones, much longer lasting effects. Uh, how many of you remember going through puberty? How long did that last? Longer than you wanted to, right? You all just want to like, tomorrow I would like to wake up and just be finished with this uh, and just buy new clothes and we're done, right? It doesn't work that way, does it, Brad? It's a long drawn out, often agonizing process. And it, it's made more agonizing because largely we're unaccepting idiots. But, uh, I, I, right, Amanda, I, I mean, it could be a lot easier if other people were just kind of like cool with it, right? Like, all right, stuff's going on, you know, come out when you feel like it. Uh, but we're not like that, unfortunately. Dean, are you okay? You look like you're on the verge of laughing. <coughs> I don't either, because I didn't say anything funny, so I'm just, I'm just, just waiting. So hormones have much longer lasting effects, right? And puberty is the great example, okay? Uh, for those of you who know someone who's on an SSRI, how often do they have to take that medication? It's daily, sometimes twice a day, right? That's how fast, you know, if you want to think about a time scale, that's like how fast neurotransmitters. I mean, just as an example, we have to take something daily, right? But hormones, I mean, if you think about puberty, I mean, that's just going to last decades. Not really decades. It's going to last a few years sometimes, right? Before, the, before it's sort of finished. So there you go. Um, hormones also have, their, their effects are really broken down into sort of two groups, okay? And we, these are really important. They have what are called organizational effects and activational effects. And I know, how many of you have taken my physio class? One of you, three and four of you, five of you, that's it? We, no one will raise their hand at the same time. Like I said, how many of you have taken my physio class? It's like a wave. Uh, <laughs> I was anticipating like, hands up, because it, it, sometimes it's hard for me to remember. I know you, you've taken my other classes, but not exactly which ones. So, you guys are going to hear a story you've heard before. It's really important to this conversation. For the rest of you, it's going to be a new story. So, it's, I, I'm going to spend a little more time on it. Like if, again, constitutional amendment, two-thirds of you had had my class, then I would go, we'll go through this relatively fast um, and kind of move on. But since only five of you, that's, that's going to be a minority, right? That's, that's the kind of thing of a super small minority party, but I can't, can't think of one. And I didn't want to call anybody like the whatever's of Congress, right? Because I, I thought some of you, some of you may like take some pride in that and some of you may not, right? Like, like, like the independents, there are like five of you. You don't count. We'll do whatever we want. So we want to think about the effects of these hormones, right? 
organizational effects. When we talk about organizational effects of hormones, we are focusing on early development. Okay? That time while you were in someone else's body cooking. Okay? Early development. Quite often, if we're going to study this uh, in animals, we will influence Katie either that embryonic environment or we will wait until immediately after birth and, and do something then. Still early in the process, right? Once you were born, you still go through a series of development, right? And, and, and so we can still, especially in animals, we can still manipulate that very early on. Okay. So we're thinking about that organizational effect. One of the prime examples of this uh, is the development of male or female sexual organs, right? This is under an organizational effect of a series of hormones, uh, testosterone being one. There are also what we call anti-mullerian hormones, things that, that shift the development away from the female reproductive system into the male reproductive system, right? You kind of have two things going on. We're not going to focus a whole lot on that, John, and that's not so important to this discussion, but that's an organizational effect. There are also organizational effects of hormones on brain structures. This is what's important to us, right? It will affect the way your brain is structured. Now, males and females have different brain structures in most species, where they at least have different sizes of certain brain structures, and they do slightly different things, right? And a prime example of this, how many of you have ever heard of maternal behavior? Right, I know, like, I like start out with like, that's like a little bit of a controversial statement, right? Like male and female brains are different, right? But they are. Um, but if you start thinking about the behavior of males and females, then you start to realize like, well, if behavior is different, then probably brains are different as well, right? Because brains drive behavior, right? So that's a pretty, there's the connection, right? And so in females, you, you have maternal behavior. Let's think about female mice, for example. Uh, one thing that female mice will do is they'll build a nest, right? And they'll build a nest when they're pregnant. We talked about this a little bit early on. You don't see male mice building a nest, right? They, they don't do that. So that's a difference in behavior. Female mice have different uh, connections in their brains, right? Different nuclei play a, a role in different behaviors. So one of those areas is called the ventral tegmental area. Everyone has one of those. If you're a female, that's going to be involved in maternal behavior. If you're a male, it's not going to be involved in maternal behavior because it's probably not going to be doing maternal behaviors. You're not going to be building a nest. Does that make sense? So there you go. So that's organizational effects. There are organizational effects on other brain regions where the presence of testosterone will sort of build these brain circuits or make these brain circuits um, active, or, or not active, but the, the able to be activated later on. Make them there. So, organizational is building, right? So that's what we're thinking about there. The activational effect of a hormone is turning on that thing that you built. So, if we think about this with um, humans, and we go back to that example of puberty, for example, right? The organizational effect while you were um, in your embryonic stages, the organizational effect of hormones uh, helped you develop either a male or a female reproductive system, right? So that's a hard thing about there. You didn't really do anything with that for a while, right? How many of you have had a reproductive system your entire life? Okay, that's, that's most everybody, right? And I'm going I'm to assume most everybody in this room falls into that group, and we're going to be talking about sort of the, the average situation here, right? Um, here's another question no one's going to raise their hands for. It. How many of you have been using that reproductive system your entire life? Yeah, not everybody, right? And, and, and in fact, I would argue that none of you have been using that, hopefully, uh, your entire lives, right? You probably didn't start using that until sometime at puberty or later, right? That's kind of the standard process. You've got these things and they're just kind of sitting around, not really doing much, and then all of a sudden they're like, whoa, that actually does something. Um, and you're like, well, oh, see what this does. 
uh, and there you go, right? And your world changes uh, because you've moved into another stage of development, right? Move through your life. So that's going to be an activational effect, right? It's going to turn on the system that you built. You built it a decade or so ago. Uh, you weren't really doing anything with it for a while, and then all of a sudden the hormones shift, and you're like, well, all right, I guess these parts are good for something else than what I've been using them for, so let's see what happens. So there you go. Organizational versus activational effects. That's the pretty standard example there, but this works for aggressive behavior as well. One thing that we notice is right around puberty, it's particularly true in males, um, intermale aggression increases, right? So the aggression between two males is going to increase during puberty compared to uh, pre-pubertal times. Okay? So even though those four-year-olds were fighting, and they do, so those four-year-olds are idiots, um, once they become, uh, once they hit puberty, the, that aggression goes up, right? And that's because uh, you're going to have a major change in hormonal levels during puberty, and that's actually going to uh, largely be testosterone. Questions about, in general, organizational versus activational effects? Everybody feel like they have a pretty good understanding of that? Who wants to hear about a rat uterus? No, nobody wants to hear about a rat uterus? It's a good story. I'm going to tell you about it anyway. But you can imagine it's in a mouse uterus if that's better. Also, they've done it in gerbils. Um, and I think it works in people. So you can think about a human uterus if you want. If you're in a rat uterus, and a rat uterus is a two-horned uterus, just in case you want to know how many horns your uterus has. If you're a rat, it has two, Meredith. If, if you're not a rat, then it has maybe some other number. Uh, most humans are just going to just be one, right? You're like, humans don't have a two-horned uterus. So a rat uterus kind of looks like this. Yeah, I know that looks like a crab claw. Uh, there's a rat uterus. That's not bad, right? Actually, what I need to I need to erase something. Let me draw that again. Uh, wrong button. In each of these horns of the uterus, uh, you are going to put a rodent fetus, or, or more than one rodent fetus, right? So rats, I don't know, if you've, have you ever seen a rat give birth? Oh, you're really missing out. That's a beautiful thing. Um, that's about how it sounds. <laughs> okay, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah, yes. um, what's really interesting is when they start licking things that come out of their ears is that to clean off the rat pups. But I haven't like that. seen one of my friend has have rats. And they have male and female rats? That's a bad idea. Uh, yeah, they give birth like every month it feels like. <laughs> they have like 15 and 13 at a time. Yeah, they'll have a lot. Yeah. Jeez. Buy those rats some condoms. So, in this uterus, in either horn, we can put uh, rat fetuses. Some of those are going to be male and some of those are going to be female, right? And so you might put like a uh, female and then you can put a, uh, let's put another female and then we'll put a male here. And then over here we're going to put a male. Female rats also have testosterone, in case you want to know. Same as you, 
true in all mammals, right? Uh, but the levels are completely different, right? So uh, males of, of a species will have a higher testosterone level than females typically of that species, right? That's a pretty standard story. So if you're floating around in this, these nice amniotic fluids and other sort of uterine juices, right? You're going to have these hormones. And so the hormones from this uh, male rat, they will sort of diffuse, and yes, testosterone really is green. They will, it's not, just in case you want it's not got a color. They will diffuse out, right? So this is, all these little wavy green lines represent diffusing testosterone. Mr. Dorr, please try to faithfully recreate this drawing on your glass. This is going to be helpful. Okay. So, we have a situation where we have uh, the, the male, the male fetus we're not really too worried about. Its testosterone level is really high. Any testosterone that floats over from a neighboring, from a brother, is not going to make a difference in its life, right? Its testosterone level is already pretty well maxed out. Okay. So increasing that testosterone level it's not going to make a difference. The females, on the other hand, this makes a difference. Okay, so Jonna, what can happen is you can be a what we call a zero M female. That's this person. Let me change my color here. Where am I? Oh, there it is. This female fetus. How many neighboring brothers does it have? Zero. So guess what? How much extra testosterone is it getting? None. Just whatever it creates itself, which is going to be some, a low amount, right? Okay. What about this female? How many neighboring brothers? One. So it's it's getting some extra testosterone, right? And so that's what we would call a one M female. This is a zero M female. Okay. What about this female over here? How many neighboring brothers? Two. So it is a 2M female because it has two male neighbors. So it is getting testosterone diffusing from two sources, right? So it's going to be coming from both. So it's going to get more testosterone than either the 1M sister that it has or the 0M sister. Does this make sense to everybody so far? It's pretty cool, right? Who's excited by this story? be fun, just wait. Now, what we have to do, Lauren is going to have to wait until these mice or, or rats or gerbils or whatever is are born, as long as it's a mammal it really works. Once these rats are born, then we can start to measure the behavior of these animals, right? And so what we have is we actually have a nice situation where we have sort of males that we can compare aggressive behavior. We have females who don't have any male neighbors. We have females with one male neighbor. And we have females with two male neighbors. So they give just sort of three levels of female testosterone, right? Okay. No male neighbors, one male neighbor, two male neighbors. Okay. So it's going to gradually go up in the amount of testosterone. If testosterone has some effect, some organizational effect, On behavior, what you would imagine is that when these pups are born and they grow up, some of them would be more aggressive than others based on the amount of testosterone they were exposed to in the uterus. Okay? This whole process is called prenatal androgenization. Somebody's going to wait on me to write that. I'm going to try it. The more testosterone you are exposed to in that prenatal environment, 
the more likely you're going to be aggressive as an adult. It's that simple. Prenatal, you're in the uterus. Androgens, those are uh, male hormones. Specifically, we're talking about testosterone in this case. Okay. So, we know that the males are going to be the most aggressive because across almost every species, males are more aggressive, right? That's a pretty universal story. The next most aggressive group of animals, of pups, are going to be the 2M females. The females that had two male neighbors because they were exposed to more testosterone than either the one male, you know, the one M females, or the zero M females, which would be the least aggressive. What do you think about that, Brad? Were you in my physio class? Yeah, you've heard this story, right? What do you think about it then? It's good. It's better the second time. It's better the second yeah. time, yeah. I think so. Right? You like this drawing of the rat uterus better than the one from that book? It's like all pink and fleshy. And, yeah. Some of you are making this face. <laughs> I mean... Yeah. Rat babies are cute, though. They taste awful. <laughs> I mean, I don't know that, but but the mother has to lick them to clean them, and they make a face like this. While they're licking it. So that's how you can you, any animal that makes this face while it's eating something, you know it tastes bad. <laughs> All right, Brad, you want me to tell them the second set of this story? Yeah. Because it gets better, right? So so here's kind of like part two of this story. Not only are these. Uh, 2M females going to be more aggressive. Uh, they're also more likely to try to participate in male sexual behaviors with other uh, with other rats when they're adults. So that's kind of interesting. And uh, if you put a 2M female with a male, and then later or before or at some other time, you put a 0M female with a uh, male, the male is going to be more likely to try to mate with the 0M female. Uh, than it is with the, the 2M female. And that could be for a variety of reasons. Um, some of that could be because if the 2M female is more aggressive, you can imagine some conflict there. Do they want part three? They want part three. Part three of this, because, you know, like, who cares about rats, right? You're not going to write a, a model of aggressive behavior. I mean, I mean, it is, but you're going to try to apply it to humans. Uh, what, there's very limited evidence in whether or not this plays a, a role in humans, right? And the reason for this is, one, how many of you, I hope none of you have children. Uh, do any of you have children you want to admit to that? Nobody does. Great. Keep it that way. How many of you had parents? I don't see any hands going up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost surprised. Uh, are you embarrassed by your parents? Do you think they're embarrassed by you? Or do you think it's mutual? Because I've come to this understanding, it's mutual, right, Brooke? Because I think about my parents sometimes, I'm like, do they want to tell people about me? You know, I don't know, right? Because we're in like different sort of ideological camps. You know? So, largely because I'm in this camp by myself. <laughs> There's not really anybody else in that group with me. So, uh, most of your parents would not say, like if they were pregnant and I came up to them and I said, hey, I got this bright idea. I really think testosterone will make your kid more aggressive. Any chance I could just, you know, give you a testosterone supplement or give you a shot full of testosterone every few days. I don't see a lot of your parents going, yeah, well that sounds exciting. Uh, <laughs> let's give that a try. I want my kid to be more aggressive, uh, right? So there's not a lot of evidence because we can't experimentally do this. The other thing that we can't do is, um, how many of you were a single birth? Yeah, how many of you don't have a twin sibling? That's what I'm asking. How many of you have a twin sibling? Anybody? Yeah, like nobody, right? How many of you know someone who is a twin? Yeah, but how many of you only know like one someone who's a twin compared to like all of the people you know who aren't twins? Like most of the people you know aren't twins, right, Lauren? Yeah. Okay, because that's how it happens. Normally you just get one at a time. Sometimes you get two, okay? Now, to make this work in humans, we would have to constantly at least get two, right? And the problem is because it's not really a horned uterus, 
even if you put two or three in there, everybody's everybody's neighbor because you're all just colliding around, right? We don't really have this control. So there, there, there's a problem. The second thing is sometimes when you do get two, right? Uh, sometimes both of those are the same sex, right? So it's like two males or two females, and those are useless to us. Okay? The only time that twins are going to be helpful in this situation is if one's a male and one's a female. Because then that female, on average, would have been exposed to more testosterone than a single birth female. Because there's a male in the uterus as well producing testosterone and it's diffusing around uh, in, in the uterus, right? Does that make sense to everybody? With what limited evidence is available? It appears as though fraternal twins, female fraternal twins, are more aggressive uh, than females on average. Right, you let out this like sigh of derision over that. Is that not, was that related to this or something else? No, I just wanted to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you want to leave so bad? <laughs> this is so thrilling, right? So, with what evidence is available, it appears as though, because I want to reiterate this fact. It appears as though uh, this even works in humans. So prenatal androgenization. Um, is effective in humans as well. And it would, you, it would be weird if it didn't, right, Dina? How do we measure that? What do you, well, so there's like this other part of the story I also didn't tell you. I'm going to tell them that part too. Is that okay, Brad? Uh, female fraternal twins are also more likely to identify as homosexual uh, than are um, women on average. So there's there's that measure, so that's, and that kind of matches up with what we see with the rats. So no, I mean by like aggressive behavior, is there like a benchmark of like normal yeah, yeah, of course, right? So you can do this with a lifetime history okay. of aggression. You could do this, put them in situations where they would have an aggressive response and measure the, the you know, likelihood or intensity of that. So there are a variety of ways you can do this. I have a question. If you took a male and put it in the middle of that right horn and then had two females as yeah. the neighbors, would the estrogen progesterone have a similar organizational effect? Not that, not that we've seen, uh, because there are times where that, that does happen, right? And we've not really seen that, that, that that's the case, as far as I know. And I think part of the reason for that is testosterone is sort of, uh, if you have a Y chromosome and that's going to drive things in a certain direction, and then you have the testosterone on top of that, it's just going to finish off the development, right? And I think the amount of testosterone created, in this case by a male rat, is going to sort of be, it's going to max out, right? And so adding in some estrogen, as long as it's, I mean, it, obviously if you were to pump in uh, an abnormally large amount of estrogen, you could probably run into some problems. But what you're going to get diffusing over doesn't really seem to make a difference because of the testosterone effects you're going to run. That's a good question. Uh, which brings me to, um, who wants to hear about crocodile and alligator penises? So, no, this is a true story. Um, why, are, why are more of you not excited about alligator penises? Um, I really, <laughs> I had really Emily imagined this real like, whoa, let's talk about alligator penises. Um, so first thing you need to know about this is there are people who measure alligator penis size. I know, <laughs> like you don't want that job for a couple reasons. <laughs> one, um, one end of the alligator has a mouth. Uh, and that mouth can bite you, so you got to watch that. The other end of that alligator has a tail, and that tail can really, it can knock you down, right? The third thing is, anybody know how, like anybody know where an alligator penis is located? It's, it's up in uh, something called, like you got to go through the cloaca, right? So just like birds, um, how many of you have ever seen a dog's penis? You could admit to, like, uh, go ahead, I mean like, <laughs> nobody's going to, yeah. But everybody has seen one, right? How many of you have ever seen a bird penis? Nobody, right? Because they keep them inside, okay? And alligators do the same thing. So, to measure, an and actually to figure out if an alligator has a penis, you gotta get your hand in there, right? Because you don't know otherwise. So if you just look at the outside, if you look at the outside of a dog, you know if it's a male or a female, right? You can go, well, that's a male. I was like, well, I don't see anything, that's a female, okay? 
Uh, with an alligator, you don't see anything at all, okay? Because they've got it all tucked up in the cloaca, right? So you, you've got to, one, you've got to get up in there. Uh, sounds, again, remember the mouth. And I, I'm feeling like, like if you just like randomly stick your hand in, in a, a hole in an animal, like they're going to try to bite you, right? I mean, that's it. so, so I, I'm imagining there's some anesthesia involved here, right? So what, and, and I don't know who's been tracking this for years that someone has been, this is kind of weird, right? So just hang in there. Uh, but what they have found is that over the last uh, several years, I don't remember what the time frame was on this particular study, they actually found a decrease in um, alligator penis size. So, so that's interesting on some level, right? Uh, they actually then simultaneously were like, well, why in the world is this happening? I, I mean, it's probably not a change in female alligator preference. Right, because there are that, that can make effects. Right, if all of a sudden all of the female alligators wanted uh, male alligators with extra teeth, then only the alligators with extra teeth would be reproducing. Right, and that's how sexual selection works. Okay, uh, so the next time you get really frustrated with the um, crop of potential mates that you have, realize that it's your ancestors' fault for picking people that were similar. To that to breed with and create more people like that, right? So, so there's there's that to think about, uh, right, Katie? I mean, that really puts a whole new light on things, right? And you're like, wow, I really wish, but, geez, Grandma, why didn't you and all of your friends, not your grandmother specifically? Hopefully, you're not trying to breed with someone who's a descendant of your grandmother, because um, that would be weird. But all of their friends, right? Why weren't they making different mate selections and, and, and so forth? Anyway, uh, they have found an increase in estrogens in the water supply uh, where these alligators were. And so that's, uh, that's, that's why like, the, the non-BPA stuff, right? Because they're like estrogens that come from plastics and other things. Yeah, there you go, right? Probably not going to affect you directly right now, right? I, I don't know, but, but over some, some time period, you know, like offspring. How many of you came to class ready for an alligator penis story? <laughs> you just don't know these days, right? Like, oh, you never know. I, I hadn't planned on telling you that story, actually. Uh, but, but it was actually a good pertinent story, I think. <coughs> you asked about estrogen effects. I would assume related to this, uh, I, didn't, I didn't read the article. I heard about it, I think, on NPR. Uh, I would assume there's some testicular size decrease as well. Uh, and that would actually probably decrease testosterone production. Uh, but again, Montana, that's going to be more than what you would have normal variation during development, right? This is going to be an excessive amount of estrogen that's being pumped in the water for alligators, for example. Does that make sense? Yeah, that was actually a good question. But so is that like organizational because it's affecting later? generations or is it activational because it's also affecting the current testosterone level? I think it's probably both. Okay. And, and Brad, that's actually a great question, right? Because you're decreasing or increasing, in this case, increasing estrogen levels, I think it probably does have some organizational effect on the next crop of offspring, but also those individuals who are ingesting that water at the moment, that hormone is going to make a difference as well. Now, that's not always, it may or may not be the case, actually. Uh, because I don't know that anybody studied this. I don't know that anybody has said, boy, I really want to make an alligator more aggressive. Uh, <laughs> try, try to give it testosterone. Or I, I think people have probably said, actually, actually alligators are, are fairly docile compared to crocodiles, right? You guys know the difference between alligators and crocodiles? If you don't, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm not going to get so upset about that. Uh, but alligators tend to be a little more docile than crocodiles. Crocodiles tend to be That may or may not be the, the case. And the reason, Bradley, is these like next two or three points that I have here. And because You're there are actually. You're welcome to the segue. Huh? You're welcome to the segue. Yeah, thank you. So, one of these is, is we're here with testosterone and songbirds. We're, that's actually an example of an activational effect. Uh, songbirds that are exposed to testosterone early in life that, that has effects on their, their aggressive behavior later, including their song development. Um, 
male songbirds that are deprived of testosterone through castration uh, at birth, their song development is altered, their aggressive behavior is altered, uh, you know, they, they, no, unless um, as adults they're given testosterone injections and then they kind of go back to normal behavior. Right? So that's, that's kind of the difference between organizational and activational effects there. Uh, however, in mice, there's this sort of uh, interesting story about progesterone and testosterone increasing one or increasing the other doesn't necessarily have an effect on the same kinds of behaviors, Brad. So sometimes incre increasing testosterone will increase aggressive behavior, but it may not have an effect on uh, sexual behavior, for example, right? It's okay, Meredith. In case you haven't heard sirens before, and nothing that may happen from time to time. I had actually anticipated hearing sirens more often, uh, not, not for any particular reason other than we're actually not that far from a hospital, right? We're really only a few blocks from a, right? I live one block away from a hospital, and I surprisingly don't really hear sirens. That's, that's what I thought, right? I, I would imagine we would hear it more often being this close to a hospital. Uh, and you're even closer than that, and I, I would have thought like all the time I would hear sirens. Maybe they just like turn it off by the time they get closer to it. Because you have to use it to like get through traffic and people got to move out of the way. Yeah, I don't know. It's really fun to see like uh, ambulances go like that way on third though, so that's, that's fun. <laughs> there you go, give that a try. If you're an ambulance driver, I would like try to get a ride in an ambulance. See if that like a heart attack for them. So, uh, Brad, sometimes you have to have two two molecules to make it work. So maybe the estrogen in and of itself may or may not have an actual behavioral effect on the croc or on the alligators, right? Um, it may just have that organizational effect and not the activational effect. Does that make sense? Uh, and like, and, and this is actually a little more pertinent because in lizards, it appears as though you would need, to, uh, if you increase testosterone, if you decrease testosterone, that's going to increase or decrease like. Uh, know, obviously aggression and sexual behaviors, uh, but corticosteroid, uh, corticosteroids might only affect uh, like reproductive behavior. They may not affect other kinds of aggressive behavior. There's one other concept we'd like to talk about, and that is uh, suppression versus interference. And this is actually kind of interesting. Sometimes hormones will suppress behavior. Right, so the presence of a certain hormone will suppress uh, that particular type of behavior, whatever that behavior is. Okay. Sometimes it won't actually suppress a behavior as much as it will cause you to perform a different behavior that prevents you from performing that original behavior. Okay. So we see this in uh, Bob White quail, right? And Bob White quail actually have um, what we call alloparenting, right? So both parents help take care of the offspring. But if you increase testosterone in the males, they actually become more aggressive and they stop parenting their young. It's not so much that the, the testosterone suppresses paternal behavior, it's just it increases aggressive behavior. So they spend more time being aggressive and uh, in aggressive interactions and they would have less time for parenting. So it's sort of a difference. Does that make sense? And sometimes that's a tricky thing. Anybody have any questions? How many of you need a drop slip? I always wondered, right? Like, like who's not coming back to class? All right, well, that's all the content I had for today. If you guys don't have any questions, we'll get